Let's start off tonight with prayer, if we would, please. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you tonight. Lord, we just come to you praising you. Praising you for who you are and what you've done for us, God. And most of all, for your son, Jesus, who we have salvation through him and able to spend eternity in your holy presence. And we thank you for that. Lord, I want to thank you for each person that's here tonight, each family represented, each couple that's here tonight. Lord, uh, I just pray a special blessing on them and their families, God. Just watch over them, provide for them, protect them in every kind of way. Lord, uh, I thank you for this Bible study that we've had the last several weeks. Lord, I, I, I thank you for, the, for your word. Lord, and I just thank you for the establishment and the covenant of marriage. And we thank you for that, God. And I hope through this study that marriages have been strengthened. Uh, Lord, be renewed, refreshed, whatever, Lord. But most of all, Lord, I pray that in, in some way it's glorified you. Lord, I, I want to pray for Dr. Tony Evans and his ministry down in Texas. Lord, uh, and the work that he and his people do, I just lift them up to you tonight. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for uh, the direction of our church, and I pray that your spirit will always abide here, and I pray that it's here tonight in the hearts of your people. So, Lord, we just praise you and thank you, and we ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is the last night of the Bible study, and we've learned about the purpose of marriage. What We learned what the definition of a kingdom marriage is and what God intended it to be. We learned about the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman and, and, and God. We learned how to embrace unity of marriage. Remember that uh, about it being, uh, being oneness and not sameness. And we learned that uh, we learned about the roles, the roles of the husband and the roles of the wife. We learned that husbands are to love their wives, and, and we learned that wives are to respect their husbands. Tonight's lesson is entitled "Rekindling Your First Love," and uh, and the main point that we're going to try to see tonight is that repositioning the priority of your relationship is the key to rekindling your first love and getting back what you may have lost as a couple. So if you've gone through this study and, and reviewed or took note of your own marriage and think that it may be lacking in some areas and what God intended, well, that's what our lesson is about tonight. How can we push the reset button? How can we, how can we re reboot? You know, some of you are... Uh, no doubt, happily married. Some of you are just okay, but there's just not much fire there. And then there's some of you which could be on the brink. I don't know. You know your own personal situation. So tonight I pray that our lesson will, will, will enlighten you in some way and that God will, will uh, help you to understand the steps that maybe you need to take to get it back to where it once was. In other words, so so tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to reset. We're going to reboot. And take it away, Lisa. So I'm sure you've all been wondering why we asked for the pictures. And I bet you thought, ah, oh, they're going to do a game and see who's changed the most or who had the biggest afro and uh, some of those other kinds of things. Um, but we're really not going to do that. We're actually going to take those and we want you to walk down memory lane for just a little while. Uh, I want you to, uh, tonight's lesson, of course, is rekindling your first love. So that's, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, when you, when love was new and uh, exciting. And uh, so hopefully you can all feel some of that again if you lost a little bit of that. So I want you to think just a few moments about that time when those sparks first flew. And think about how you met. Where were you? What was your first date? Who said I love you first? When did you realize that you were going to get married? 
And what's your favorite memory of your wedding day? All right, so we're going to get the lights. And By the way, we want to thank Daniel for all of his hard work on this.
Seemed like it got the biggest reaction out of me. <laughs> <laughs> that hair was doing it, wasn't it? But he was styling. me. All right, Lisa. Okay, so hopefully y'all had as much enjoyment out of that as I did. I just loved as the pictures were coming in and, and seeing everybody. So, um, page 50, or excuse me, 63 in your book, we're going to read, You Have Left Your First Love. And when he talks about first love, he's talking about the love you as a couple had at first. Okay, read along with me. A church had been birthed in Ephesus through the work and ministry of the Apostle Paul, and in the beginning... The people in the church were on fire for God, Acts 19. They had brought out their trinkets, magic books, and anything associated with their old way of life and literally set it all ablaze out of devotion to God. Their relationship with the Lord was one of passion, zeal, and connection. Many relationships are like this when couples first get married. Personal sacrifice doesn't seem like sacrifice. Devotion comes naturally. Yet over time, as we will see in Revelation, that passion somehow morphs into performance as something in the relationship fizzles. Let's look at how this unfolds for the church of Ephesus, where what started out as a strong, recommend, uh, strong commendation for doing great things ended up revealing an empty heart beneath it all. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false, and you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. Revelation 2, 2 through 3. To set the stage, the church of Ephesus had developed into a serving church. What began with a passionate fire for the Lord had produced what most would consider great things. The Ephesian believers were spiritual bumblebees. Everyone was in a ministry, engaged in activity, and doing something to promote good while keeping out evil. If we were to put this passage in the context of marriage, these are husbands and wives who check off items off their to-do list. They read the Word of God, play with the kids, and perform the actions that ought to make for a strong home. They don't give in to laziness or selfishness, but rather seek to serve. However, there is a but. After all the accolades and praise for a job well done, God follows his message to the church with a small conjunction that had a large meaning. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love, Revelation 2.4. In other words, yes, church at Ephesus, you have done a lot of great stuff. Yes, you are the recipient of many compliments, but... I have one major criticism that cancels out the rest. You have left your first love. A lot of things may be going right, but this one wrong thing is majorly wrong. Okay, there on page 65, there's a few questions. that, Considering what Lisa just read, you know, what happens to the fire that was there at the first? When you roll back the clock, we go back when we're at, that stage in our life where, where those pictures were taken, you know, why aren't we there now? Why don't we have the same feelings now that we had then? You know, wh how does our passion morph into a performance over time? You know, well, I would think it's because real life sets in. We start getting a whole lot of other responsibilities in our life. We have jobs. We have household chores. We have kids and the demands that come along with them and their and their problems and and their their issues that they have. And then then in reality we, we forget to carve out time for each other. We forget that we get so involved in all this that's going around around us that we sort of forget each other. And that basically just like the church at Ephesus you know, they were doing all these, all this ministry, all this program, everything. They were, like, like it said, they were busy bumblebees, but they had left their first love. 
It's all about keeping the main thing, the main thing. With a church, the main thing is Jesus Christ, and you got to keep him the main thing. In our marriage, the main thing that started was our love for each other, and that's the main thing that we got. And we can do that. We do that through Jesus. We're putting him at the head of our church, and then at the head of our life, and then his love flows through us to our spouse, and everything just lines up. We were talking about um, how when you, even though you're doing good things, you're helping others, you're, um, you know, you could be doing church work, you could be doing all these wonderful things in your life, and what happens or seems to happen is the people who are closest to you, they get neglected whenever we start doing too much, and and it just kind of happens because you you have deadlines to meet, you have to do this, you have to do that, and you know they're gonna they're gonna be okay, and then eventually they're not okay. You know, I, I wrote this down in my notes this week, and and I thought about I don't know if you know you know Joe DiMaggio was married to Marilyn Monroe for nine months. After she died, for nearly two decades, for about twenty years, he sent half a dozen roses to her grave three times a week for 20 years. And I, I don't know, you know, what made me think about that, but it, but then I got to think about roses and sending flowers. And, you know, you could send your wife a dozen roses every week, but if the love is not there, it's just a performance. And I think that's sometimes what we fall into. You know, we do do some nice things some, from time to time, but there's no love there. It's just a performance. We're just acting. So why is, the fir why is first love so important to God? You know, we'll hear on the Dr. Evans tonight on the video and learn from the video to answer this uh, because first love is different than just love. He draws the difference, tells what the difference is. You know, when somebody feels first, they are the most important, they are the most critical. Whenever he tells you the definition of love, he replaces the word compa uh, compassionate with passion. I mean, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Compassion. Yeah, he replaces passion with compassion. So we'll see that tonight in the video. Dan? It's time for the video. So, Bobby, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and hit the lights and we'll, we'll watch our last video of the Bible study. preacher was performing a wedding ceremony, and um, he came to that part where he said, if anyone here has any legitimate, verifiable reason why this union should not occur, speak now or forever hold your peace. A voice rang out, I'm against the marriage. The preacher said, shut up, you're the groom. <laughs> We're living in a time when folks are getting divorced almost at the wedding ceremony. Wow. It's giving up before they've had a chance to really see what it was all about because they have not been given an understanding of the kingdom purpose for marriage. Let's define it again. Kingdom marriage is one where a husband and wife have committed to operate in unison 
under divine authority to replicate the image of God and to express his rule, his kingdom rule, in the context of the calling he's given them. It's a kingdom issue, but when you operate for the kingdom underneath the covenant, according to the roles, then there is the outworking of the blessing, the things that you want from marriage, happiness and joy and fulfillment. All of those are important. All of those are key, but none of those is purpose. Back in the days gone by before seatbelts were required, you always knew the couples that were happy. They were sitting up under each other. Looked like only one person was in the front seat because she all up on him, all up on him, just sitting next to him. You also knew when it wasn't going well because she was at the door. <laughs> one wife driving with her husband said, do you remember how when we sat close to one another and we were so close? The husband said, yeah, I remember, but I haven't moved. I'm in the same place. Somebody's moved. Rather than getting a divorce or living in misery, as though those are the only two options, there's another option. Returning to your first love. The return. Getting it back. There, there is another option. God spoke of that option in Revelation chapter 2. But he lays out some key principles for our relationship as he talked to his own bride, the church, since we're called the bride of Christ. Here was the problem. The problem was they had programmed out their relationship. He says in verse 2, I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. I know what you're doing. We hear this from couples all the time. I go to work. I bring my money home. I take care of the kids. I and they list out the good things that they are doing. Why should you be complaining? I cook, I clean. Uh, the good things. Now, the bad things are obvious, but, but what about when you're doing all this good stuff like they were doing? And God says, you're doing it. I recognize you're doing it. You got a program, <laughs> but the program has killed the relationship. Notice what he says. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, God only has one complaint. You've left your first love. He gives five commendations. You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. So I know the five but I want to talk about the one. The one thing that's missing. God says, I'm sitting in the same place. You left. But notice what they left. They didn't leave love. Uh-uh. They left first love. Hmm. Now, we've added something to love. Love, we've defined as, the com as compassionately and righteously seeking the well-being of another. We're all called to love. But you can love and not like. But he adds a word, a key word, first. So he's not really talking about love. He's talking about what position the love is in. Is it first? When Jesus was asked, what's the first commandment? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, might, and soul. 
That's the first thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Everything changes when first is put in front of love. Because now the relationship trumps the program, and the program doesn't trump the relationship. First love is a little different than love. Love is compassionately and righteously pursuing the well-being of another. First love is passionately and righteously seeking the well-being of another. Love is compassionately. First love is passionately. Why? Because you've changed it positionally. When somebody feels first, the most important, the most critical, all of a sudden now you are igniting something. You're igniting what gets lost with just love. Because you can have just love with no passion. Loving your enemies. You're not passionate about that. But you can't have first love without passion. First love involves fire. Because of where it's positioned. And when it loses its position, even to good things, the five things God commends them on, you have left first love even though you still love. A lot of folk who get divorced still love. They just don't love each other first. <laughs> the guy loves the business first. She loves the kids first. Something else in the program has shifted this thing. And when it shifts it, remember the story of Martha and Mary? Martha is in the kitchen, and she's sweating. She's working so hard to prepare Jesus a good meal. And she had to be frying chicken since they were all preachers, and that's the gospel bird. Uh, but she's making this big meal up for Jesus and the disciples. And Mary is out there sitting at Jesus' feet, just soaking it up. Martha is a little bit evangelically ticked off. She marches out there and says, Jesus, would you tell Mary, since I ain't talking to her right now, would you tell her to come in the kitchen and help me? I'm doing a good thing. Jesus says, I will not. Mary has chosen the better part, and I will not take it from her. She's chosen relationship over program. She's chosen to be at my feet. Now, do I want you, Martha, to do nothing? No, but one thing is necessary. Guess what, Martha? A casserole will do. I'd rather have a casserole with you out here than the son Mary back there with you and have two frustrated folk in the house. Because when things get shifted to program, everybody gets irritated and frustrated, the, the relationship, the kids. everybody, Everything gets out of order because the relationship priorities has shifted. He's talking about now first love. It's an order thing. He says, and you've left your first love, and so there is no longer fire in the house. The fire is gone because the program has replaced it. A simple shift from love to first love. In other words, repositioning the priority of the relationship is the key to getting back what you may have lost over the years and the history of all that has taken place, causing the relationship to become dulled, causing to now there be discussions about divorce, or a decision to live in misery. No, he says there must be a recalibration of first love. You know, everybody who knows me, whenever I'm eating somewhere and they know me, they know to bring out the Tabasco. <laughs> I am a connoisseur of hot sauce. I, I love hot sauce on just about anything. The hotter, the better. My wife finds new hot sauces just for me to try. 
so that I can just 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 get it. Because no matter what it is, I want to make sure I put the fire on it. So no matter what's being served up in the home and in the marriage, make sure you always put the fire on it first. Yeah. See, because then you're lighting up everything. Everything is being set ablaze and being placed on fire because it is first. And when we get into the habit of it being first, then you got to do the program. I remember one time when I was catching Flight 72 out of Atlanta to Dallas. I'm catching Flight 72 out of Atlanta to come back to Dallas. There is a famous restaurant that fries chicken <laughs> in Atlanta. And uh, they had a, a branch of it at the airport. So I, I hadn't tasted this chicken in years, and so I had to get this chicken. This Because I, I lived in Atlanta for a while, and, and I love this chicken. So I went and ordered the chicken, but as I ordered the chicken, over the loudspeaker said, last call, flight 72 to Dallas. <laughs> I'd miscalculated the time, <laughs> and I got this hot piping chicken. So I'm on the horns of a dilemma, because I, I, I love this chicken. <laughs> do I eat this chicken and risk missing my flight, or do I leave the chicken to catch my flight? Well, I took my chicken on the flight. <laughs> God was not asking them to give up the program. He's just saying, don't miss the flight. Because you didn't come to the airport for chicken. You came to the airport for the flight. So don't let the sweet tasting aroma of other things get in the way of the reason for why we're here in the first place. And why are we here? We're here for a kingdom purpose for marriage. What, I mean, you would say you were dumb for settling for sweet-tasting chicken and missing the flight because that's not why you're here. And so he gives a prescription. He gives a very simple prescription for reigniting the relationship. He gives it with the three R's. He says, first of all, remember. In verse 5, he says, Remember, take a mental tour and go back to when you didn't have the kids. You didn't have all the, the three, four, five-bedroom houses, two, three-car garages, double jobs, uh, all of the stuff. Go back to the apartment. When you didn't have to, all this other stuff to worry about. He says, remember, remember when all of it was just dreams. You were just talking about how it will be one day. And remember, go back. Because back there is really how it is supposed to be. When, when you didn't have the programs. Tony Evans, go back there when there weren't 10,000 members in the national ministry. Go back there when it wasn't all of the staff and all of the... Go back there and remember. Why does he tell you to remember? Because <laughs> it's easy to forget why we hooked up in the first place. Because right. the programs have gotten in the way. So remember, because back there, there was fire. Back there, you couldn't keep your hands off of one another. Right. Back there, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't uh, skipping the phone calls. <laughs> back there, when you remember, it was all about that relationship back there. He says, remember how it was back there? Remember is the first R. I, was, I take my kids on vacation to see their grandparents in Baltimore. We would drive from Dallas to Baltimore. That's 23, 24 hours. And so I developed this little private contest with myself. The private contest with, my, with, with myself was, um, how far could I drive without stopping this year than I did last year. That is, other than to get gas and to let people use the restroom, how far could I go without stopping, without taking a rest break? So I did like eight hours the first year, hour, year 12 hours the second year, 15 hours the next year, and then I, then I hit the bullseye. <laughs> I went all the way to Baltimore from Dallas without stopping. 
But you have to understand, I'm good for nothing now. <laughs> I'm, I'm good for nothing. Daddy, shut up. <laughs> Don't you talk to me. We want to, you ain't doing nothing with me. I, I'm, I'm going home. It's taken me three days to recover from family vacation. <laughs> Because I forgot why we're taking the trip. Yeah, yeah. We're taking the trip to have a family vacation. We're not taking the trip so I could pass a personal goal. Right. But when you forget and it becomes something else, everybody's frustrated along the way. Yeah. Who wants the vacation with a father who's too tired to be on a vacation? I forgot. So he says, remember from where you have fallen. The second R, he says, repent. He says, repent. To repent means to change your mind in order to reverse your direction. Now that you remember how it really was when we were really in love and you, we were first with each other and we were really excited, he says, now you must repent. Repent means to change your mind in order to reverse your direction. It's like going down a highway, seeing you're going the wrong way, and looking for the next exit. We'll call that confession off-ramp. You know, I confess. I, I, I've, I've gotten things whacked up. Then you've got to go over an overpass. We'll call that grace overpass, <laughs> where there's a bridge to come to the other side. Then you get back on the other direction on an on-ramp. We'll call that restoration on-ramp. Guess what's happening now? You're headed now in the right direction. Have you ever noticed when you're on a long trip? When you're on a long trip, it seems to take less time to get home than it did going, even though it's the same distance. It's the same distance, but coming back seems easier. You know why? Because <laughs> you're going home. <laughs> you're going back. To where you belong. So it's confessing. I've left. I haven't prioritized this first. Give me the grace to cross over. Give each other the grace to cross over and then restore each other so we can get home. How do you get home? First one is remember. The second one, now that you've remembered, repent. Repent to God. Repent to your mate. And then finally, he says, repeat. Do what you did at first, verse 5 says. Do what you did at first. Mm. Go back there and repeat the stuff that you did that set the flame initially. Some of our wives were not that impressed with us at first. But then we started messing with their heads. We got in their heads. And they went from, I don't like him, to he all right. <laughs> then it went from, I don't like him, to he all right, to he kind of nice. <laughs> then we went from, I don't like him, to he all right, to he kind of nice, to girl, I'm in love. <laughs> what happened? You kept, you kept at it. 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 And you broke down that resistance. So given the history, given the breakdown, how long it takes, it's not going to happen overnight. But you come at it. You come at it. You come at it. Why? Because she's been created to respond. Yeah. She's been created to respond. Now, there may be a brick wall up now because of history, but you come at it, and you come at it, you come at it, you come at it with the principles that we've learned with a kingdom purpose and perspective, and you come at it, you come at it, and you come at it, and you repeat your first works over again, creating this first template. And then you enter into a return to your first love. You enter a restoration. Now, there are different kinds of people who are here and who are... Uh, are looking at this study. Some are happily married and this is a refresher. Some are doing okay. It's not exciting, but you don't want to divorce. You just, the, the get up and go has gotten up and gone. No fire, but, but we're okay. 
Some are on the brink. It's touch and go. Don't know if I can stay in this. The beautiful thing about God is he can hit a bullseye with a crooked stick. If you will return first to him and then to each other, you can begin to experience restoration. Don't trade in a car when all you need is a tune-up. <laughs> Many people, when they need a tune-up, want to buy a new car. When a little turn here and a little turn there will have that baby singing again. Don't cut off your leg just because you got a splinter. A splinter hurts. An amputation is worse. Yes, God does give a limited amount of grounds for divorce. But he can restore any relationship where both parties are willing to come under the covenant. Let me close with a thought taken from a biblical story. Because some people need miracles. This can only be saved by a miracle. Okay? The first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding. The wedding at Cana. That's the first. Uh, when Jesus stepped out and went public and wanted to, and wanted to uh, uh, exercise his divine power, it was at a wedding. He's at the wedding because he's for marriage and a problem occurs. They have run out of wine. They've run out of the good wine. You serve the good wine first. In the Bible, wine was always related to joy. When not related to drunkenness, it was related to joy. So you'll find the word wine used throughout the Bible for celebration and joy. So it was at a wedding. But the good wine was gone. Back then, weddings weren't a little reception like we have today. Weddings were extravagant, ongoing events. So people sometimes would be there for days at the reception. And so the wine was gone. The joy was gone. Jesus' mother goes over to Jesus and says, Jesus, this would be a good time for Clark Kent to find a telephone booth. <laughs> this would be a good time for you to do your Superman thing. This would be a good time for you to stretch your stuff. This would be a great time for a miracle. Jesus said to her, woman, my time has not yet come. Meaning, this is not the time for me to go public yet. I'm not ready to, to put on my cape and my, you know, my jumpsuit with a nest on my chest yet. However, bring the water pots. The servants are told to fill the water pots with water. Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, why does Mary have to say that? Because the request didn't make sense to the need. Water pot, we didn't come here about water. We came here about wine. There is no good wine left. The wine is gone. There's no joy in this house. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though it doesn't compute, doesn't, doesn't cogitate, Put water in it. They go and they fill the barrels with water. They bring the water back to Jesus, the barrels back to Jesus. On their way back, the water becomes wine. On their way back, the water becomes wine. That which was depressing, that which was discouraging, that which had, which had ripped them out of the joy 
had now returned. There's wine. They taste the wine. They taste the wine. They are stupefied because they said it is normal to serve the good wine first and to leave the bad wine last. But you have saved the best for the last because this wine is better than the wine we started with, which we thought was the good wine. But you've left the best to last. If your joy is gone, if your hope for the relationship is gone, maybe you haven't put water in your barrel yet. Please notice something. They had to do something before God did something. All through the Bible, you will see God before he performs a miracle, calling on the people who needed the miracle to do something first. Moses, hold out your rod. Then he opens up the Red Sea. Priest, step in the water. Then he opens up the Jordan River. Martha, move the stone. Then he raises Lazarus from the dead. They had to do something prior to the miracle. Why? Because he had to see faith first. Many of us want to say, God, do a miracle. Then I'll respond. God is saying, respond, then I'll do a miracle. And if we will all respond to the kingdom purpose for marriage, if we will begin to fulfill what God has told us to do, then you will discover he has saved the best one for last. Any comments or first-hand observation or anything about the video? Anybody got anything on their heart? Okay, I'm on page 66 in your book. I'm going to look at these questions tonight. It says, describe the difference between love and first love. You know, how can you love someone but feel no passion for him or her? If you remember, I said that first love is whenever they're the most important and they're the most critical. First love involves passion and fire. You know, why would two people who still love each other get divorced? Is it possible? I've heard that. I've heard people say, well, you know, yeah, we're divorced. I still love her. I still love her. Well, it's because they are, you know, they are not their first love. They let something else get in their way. Something else took their place in that position, as he says. You know, they got lost in the weeds somewhere with everything that was going on with life. And they're just too involved. Like he said, they're just too in too involved in the day-to-day -day activities and everything that pulls on them other than the relationship. Okay, second question is, when Jesus visited the home of his friends, Mary and Martha, it says Martha worked hard to do all the things a good hostess does while Mary sat at Jesus' feet and hung on to his every word. Said, what does Dr. Evans mean when he says Mary chose the relationship over the program? You know, it's like we said before, you know, sometimes churches do that. They get so involved in their ministries, they get so involved in their program, they forget the real reason why they're even there. And the same thing can happen in a marriage. Mary. She chose being at the feet of Jesus and listening to, hanging on to and listening to every word that he had to say. 
whereas Martha was involved in the program. She was the one who worried about the dinner, about cooking dinner for the men and the, the folks that were there. She, like I said, she didn't do, you know, not necessarily wrong. It's just that uh, she was letting the program get in front of the relationship. So how do you strike a balance? Because kids can't go away. The house cleaning can't go away. You know, paying the bills can't go away. Our jobs can't go away. So, you know, how do, how do, we, how do we hit that balance? You have to really be intentional because, you know, as life goes along, it's like you said, all those things have to happen. But you can let those things happen and then forget about the real reason that you're married to someone. And so you just got to be real intentional and, and plan sometimes that time together and carve that out. I remember one of the first sessions that we had, I think Allison, Allison Keith talked about her and Jeremy, 20 minutes that they set aside in the afternoon when they got home from work or whatever. That's, that's, that's an example of what, what we might have to do, you know, to get there. So, like Lisa said, you have to intentionally carve out those times to spend time together. Uh, sometimes you just have to let things go. Sometimes the house might need to just stay dirty while you go out to eat together or something. And you just approach responsibilities differently. Instead of going in different directions, do things together. Okay, uh, in the video, it said Dr. Evans tells a story of almost missing his flight. He was in the Atlanta airport, and he got, he heard that intercom, and he knows it just makes you just, your stomach come up in your throat, and your <laughs> gate may be, you know, a long way away, and they make this announcement, your plane's about to leave, and he, he's standing in line getting fried chicken. But, you know, he had to make a choice, you know, do I stay here and eat my chicken here? He could have just took the chicken with him, but we don't need to forget why we're at the airport. We don't need to forget why we're in this relationship with our wife, in other words. We don't need, as a church, we don't need to forget why we're here. It's like I said earlier, that we're, we're here to worship God, to worship Jesus, and to keep him as the main thing. You know, why do couples sometimes lose sight of that true purpose? And I wrote down that their relationship with the Lord has been neglected and they've lost sight of what a kingdom marriage or a kingdom marriage is. I think sometimes, too, we have such expectations nowadays with social media and television and and your house is supposed to look a certain way, your clothes are supposed to look a certain way, your kids are supposed to look a certain way. And sometimes we, uh, we take the world's unrealistic ex expectations and put those into our lives when they don't really have to be there. And that's right. We, we sometimes we try to keep up with the Joneses. We're worried about what our neighbors are doing. You know, we're, we're worried about... Uh, the next technology that comes out or, you know, uh, you know, we fish a lot. We buy depth finders, we buy trolling motors that, you know, GPS stuff, all kinds of electronic. You cannot buy something two days later, it's outdated. They've got the new thing out there, just like iPhones or anything else we buy. And, and, that, and some people just eat up with that kind of thing. Not us, though. No, not us. <laughs> but... <coughs> You know, and, and, you know, the goal keeps changing. We may meet one goal, we just keep changing. We keep striving, we keep striving, we keep striving, but we're not doing anything for our marriage. 
what's the best strategy for guarding against the potential distractions in your relationship? You know, in the verses, it remember from where you have fallen. You know, go back to that time. Remember from where you came. Remember where you were at at one time in your relationship, in your life. When you repent, you change your mind, you reverse direction. You hit a reset button, in other words. You repeat. If you keep doing, just keep doing what you're doing, and that's the wrong thing to do, you're going to get the same result. You know, you need to stop and just reset. Just like reboot, rebooting your computer. You know, sometimes you fool with your computer, you can't get nothing to work. Finally, you get so upset, you just grab a hold of that power cord and just jerk it out of the wall. That'll fix it. <laughs> but sometimes that's what we need to do with our marriages. And I'm not talking about ending them. I'm just talking about rebooting them. Start over. Start from scratch. Go right from the first. Okay. On page 68, it said, According to Dr. Evans, the first step in reigniting the fire in your relationship is remembering the early days with your spouse. He said, when you go back to that time before you had kids or a mortgage or anything else together, what do you see? What do you see? Anybody want to tell us what you see? I'll tell you what I say I see. I see a 60 by 12, 1969 mobile home with a rotten floor in it. That's what we had. When the wind would blow outside, our curtains moved. <laughs> yeah. Not lying. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, I know, I probably told this before, I might have done it in this study, but we bought 500 gallons of propane. Of course, we took every dime of money we had. We got 500, it filled our tank up, 500 gallons. It was empty. 500 gallons of propane, it lasted two weeks, and it was gone. <laughs> and that's, that's how drafty that old trailer was. It was pitiful. You want to tell them you're falling through the floor? Um, yeah, well... I, yeah, I actually fell through the floor. Um, my brother-in-law was knocking at the door, and I had gone to get something in the living room, and I wasn't, I had just been in the shower, and I wasn't completely closed. And so I was like, don't come in. And I turned around to head back to the, to the bedroom, and literally one leg went all the way through the floor. Okay, and so right. then I'm screaming, and he's like getting ready to come in the door. I'm like, no, no, do not come in. <laughs> and it, so it took a little bit of time to get my leg out. But anyway, yeah, it was it was really bad. And um, it, <laughs> we had we had literally had our boxes of college books set in over holes in the floor. Um, and and I don't know that I told you all this, but when we got married, I told you I was young. I was 17, but I had not started my senior year in high school yet. We were between, I was between my junior and senior year in high school. It was actually cheaper for us to get married at that time than it was to date because of the way the economy was. But, um, uh, so yeah, we started out with nothing. And our first car, when I drove it through the um, McDonald's drive through they asked me not to do that anymore because it smoked so bad that they got choked up. So, <laughs> so it was bad. But, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, but my father-in-law, when we talked to him about getting married, he said, "Well, you've got to finish. High, you've got to finish high school." And I said, "Well, the plan is to go to college, so I think that's a, rec a prerequisite to get into college is finishing high school." But uh, so anyway, uh, we are we are we go against the statistics. Most people wouldn't be at forty years plus of marriage if if that was the way you started out, but. Um, we were, we were blessed. Uh, the Lord just blessed us. And, and uh, all through the, the times of uh, not having anything, he was, he just, we just lived on love because that was all we had. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Yeah, I can remember we used to gather returnable bottles. Some of you young people don't even know what a returnable bottle is. But you have to pay a deposit on them. If you knew the grocery purse, like the, the guys that own the store out at, Kirksey, they wouldn't charge you the deposit. They just trust that you'd bring them back, you know. We'd, we'd go around finding bottles, and, and we'd go get money for them so we could go to the grocery. Yeah, store. I kept them in one of the closets that we didn't use, and I just stacked them up in there. And then the whenever we had, 
<laughs> That's right. When we had no money, there would there would be just enough bottles to buy milk, bread, bologna, and maybe you know a, a Coke or something. But yeah, we were we were poor, but that was okay. <laughs> yeah, but what you know what was different back then? We had worries, but we had different worries. They were different in the kind of worries we have today. We worry about kids now. <laughs> but, you know, think about it. I, want you, I, I know y'all get tired of hearing about us, but I want you thinking about yourself. I want you thinking about you and your spot. Where were y'all when you got married? How were things back then? What was different? What did you worry about then that you don't worry about today? And how did it make you feel when you recall those days? Well... You know, it's, it's, I'm fond of those days, really, because for many of us, I mean, you know, like me and Lisa, love was about all we had. I mean, it was a sure thing. That's mm -hmm. Brother Jim, yeah. Brother Jim, you brought up something that I don't know that I can answer for you, but I know that it's true. When you start out in ministry, and you meet the church, and you appreciate the church. Mm -hmm. Right. And that kind of brings up another point. We didn't have Kelsey until we had been married 10 years. And, uh, I mean, that was intentional because we both wanted to go to college. And uh, so, and I worked full-time when, when I was um, going through college. And I didn't. <laughs> you farmed. I had an outside job. I also farmed. <laughs> but we, as we were going through this, you know, talking about different things you know it brought up lots of memories for us and um during that 10 years though we just it was really like we dated for 10 more years I mean it was because we had we had some of the best friends they were uh good good godly guys and um they would call us literally at sometimes two o'clock in the morning we'd already been in bed asleep and they'd say hey we're playing cards over it so-and-so's house y'all come on and we're like no no yeah yeah come on and we would get up and get our clothes on and head out and go play cards and I told him I said you know it, it talks about the things that you miss that um, that you remember and I said the spontaneity that we had when we were younger and we would just do that we uh, hadn't planned on going to Florida for spring break and some of our friends just begged and begged and begged so we left the next day you know what I mean Things like that that I miss. I miss that. That makes you feel and alive only, and That was only new. because they loaned us the money. Well, yeah, it. that's true. They did. <laughs> but they that's wouldn't leave us alone. And so they were like, okay, we'll go. And, yeah, they did. They loaned us the money because we didn't have it. But, uh, anyway, that, you know, I, I, when you go back and you think about things, like I said, it wasn't just our dating time. It was the time after we were married, too, that, that there were experiences – experiences then and I think oh, why don't we do that now so we may head to Florida after this or something <laughs> no, I'm kidding <laughs> for a trip to Nashville. Huh? A trip to Nashville. oh yeah yeah he wants me to tell this this is actually one of the most romantic things he'd ever done um, uh, I was in college 
full-time and working full-time and married, and so life was extremely busy, and I was just having a really, really difficult time during this period of time and working a whole lot of hours and, and had tremendous amount of schoolwork on me, and so uh, I got off from work, um, I think it was, a, I don't know, Friday or something, and so I go out to my car, and he's sitting there in um, the vehicle, and I, I'm like, what are you doing? And he said, I just thought we would just go away for the weekend. And he, I said, well, I got to go. Where? where, where? And I think we went, we went to Nashville. But, and I said, well, I've got to go home, go home and pack. And he said, I've already, I've, everything's packed up. We're ready to go. And so he drove me from there to Nashville. And it was just, set, the gesture was as wonderful as the time away. And so, just being, you know, I miss those things. Yeah. And uh, you're saying I don't do them now? No. <laughs> return, return. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anybody else? I know y'all got some stories out there. Anybody else that need to share anything? All right. All right. Number five, the second step and the first the second step is to repent. We, we remembered first. That's what we were just talking about. The second step is to repent or reverse your course. Um, and he used the analogy, if you'll remember, of the confession off-ramp. It's like you're traveling down a highway. You need to turn around and go in the other direction because you're going the wrong way. So you have this confession off-ramp. And what does that mean for you? What, what does that mean, you know? Well, first of all, you have to recognize the issue. Recognize that there is an issue that's causing problems. Then you take responsibility. You, you own it. You, you know, it's nobody else's fault. It's mine. I, I've done this to you, and I'll confess it. So what then does the grace overpass look like? What does that look like to you? Well, that's real forgiveness. You know, if somebody's going to confess to you, okay, I've done you wrong. You know, I, 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 I've let other things get in the way. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. Then we have a duty. If they're sincere about that, we have a duty to forgive them. I think that's biblical. It's... Uh, you know, in Matthew 18, 22, around in chapter 18 of Matthew, Peter asked Jesus, hey, what do we do? We forgive our brother seven times? What did Jesus say? He said, 70 times seven. And he didn't mean 449. He, you always forgive them as many times as it takes. So, you know, real forgiveness doesn't mean that we keep dragging it back up as we go along. It doesn't mean that we use it as a verbal jab every now and then when we're when we have some disagreement, you know, and bring it back up again. And another thing is that when someone confesses something that they've done wrong, it's honestly very seldom does the complete fault fall on one person. That's true. So you might, you know, do a little soul searching to see what you may have done to um, add to that or. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, Tess and I got married, and uh, no, it's not going to crash. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. So we got married, and we we hung out at the church, and uh, I had never really driven cross country, and my sense of direction was horrible. Uh, I get turned around people all the time trying to tell me how to get somewhere, and I'll be naming buildings and streets. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't get it. So, at 20 year old, we took off. We were going to go to Gatlinburg, and uh, in Nashville there was some construction, and I got on an off ramp, and uh, it was dark, like it it was late. Uh, I had no clue where I was at. Um, we were panicking, and I got behind a semi, and the semi did not stop. It didn't even stop lights or stop sign so neither did I. I I just figured wherever he was going I was following 
and we pull up, and he finally stops, right? And so here it is. It's dark. We're scared. Uh, true story, right? We're scared. Um, and there's a guy standing on the corner. I rode down her window. <laughs> and I, I, I'm lost. I'm, you know, I got off the four lane. I need to get back on this four lane. And we're going to Gatlinburg. And he said, if you would have turned left at any point, you'd have been back on the four lane. We were running parallel with the four lane this time. And it got, you know, thinking about that story gets me thinking about, you know, what we're talking about here. At any point, I could have made a small adjustment and been where we wanted to be. It wasn't anything major. And so many times in life, we just, we're going along and we, we think we're in some horrible situation. And then, you know, something bad's fixing to happen. And, and if we would just stop for a moment and look at the situation and make a small adjustment, it can put us right where we want to go. Yeah. And uh, we, we just got to take a breather sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, ask for help. Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, that second question right there said, and what's the, this really hits home to me too, is, is the root. In what specific ways has God extended grace to you? Wow. You know, when we stop and think about that, about God extending grace to us and who we are, then we certainly need to extend grace to our spouse. You know, first of all, salvation, of course. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we were just sinners, and he died for us. You know, I was saved when I was eight years old, and like I've told many of you before. But when I was young, teenager, and in college and all, and, you know, God showed me a lot of grace during those times. I, might not, I wasn't as close to him as I am right now, but he showed lots of grace on me while I was an idiot. He really, you know, he he <laughs> he he had to put double angels on me with some of the things I pulled, but he took care of me. He he showed me grace. When I was an idiot, <laughs> yeah. that's gonna be the name <laughs> be of it. You know, we were leaving Opera Land. Y'all remember Opera Land? Oh yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. We was left. We was leaving Opera Land. We'd been there all day long. It was hot. I mean, our, all of our hair was matted to our head back when I had hair, <laughs> and uh, we we was leaving. It, it's hard. It was hard to drive to Asheville because you didn't go very often. Right. You know, now you just phew, you got you got Google Earth. I mean, you can go through any, you know. But uh, I make the wrong turn, pulling out, and I I go totally the wrong direction. I was so sanctified then. <laughs> I got so mad that I started, I just hit the steering wheel, the middle of the steering wheel about three good times, and just out of frustration. <laughs> and the horn got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I pitched a little fit, and there's my kids in the back seat. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, that's bad. <laughs> We're going out. Down the road, the horn <laughs> so I pull over and disconnect the horn. <laughs> and that's that kind of that was the story of our life back then, you yeah. know. I mean yeah. until uh anyway, but you know, we always work through it. Oh yeah. <laughs> now we look back, think of every time every time we see a white Taurus. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I thought we might, y'all might want to know that one. <laughs> All right. So, in, in what specific ways can you extend grace to your spouse? And I was going to, you know, we can show our spouse lots of grace. And, and I chose, and Lisa and I talked about it, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through seven. If you recognize that, that's a love chapter, but first Corinthians thirteen. Love is patient, love is kind, 
and he's not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. If we love our spouse, and and she or he is our first love, then we're you know we're gonna we're gonna forgive them. We're gonna show them grace, and that love is what's gonna take care of all that. Okay. Well, um, the next one is about restoration on ramp, and um, I just want to share a quick story. I had a, a really good friend that y'all wouldn't know or anything, but um, her husband had an affair and she found out about it and uh so i mean she was extremely upset as you can expect but uh he confessed to her what had happened and and he repented and i'm sitting in the wings watching all of this and um she's you know talked to me about it and stuff and and she took him back and completely took him back and loved him and offered him more grace than I have ever seen and that has been several years back and today they are both totally committed to the Lord her father came to the Lord after a a life away way 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 away but um, she was such an example of love and grace that I think it had a huge impact on her dad. And like I said, both of them now live a a life that is so committed to uh, Jesus and um, working in their church. And it just was such a, um, like I said, such a a picture of grace. And, um, you know, I just don't, that I was so... I admired her so much for that. So. Okay, we're going to read the, on page 70, and it's entitled Repeat. One of the ways to rekindle your relationship is to ask yourself, would I have said that or acted this way when we were dating? If the answer is no, then why would you do it now? Honor your spouse with the same attentiveness and love that you showed at the start, and you'll experience a renewal in your relationship. God has taken us from step one, which is to remember, to step two, which is to repent, to repent. The last step in returning to our first love is to repeat. God tells us to do the deeds you did at first. Revelation 2.5. Most couples don't date much after they get married. Demands and schedules start to weigh down the relationship, which makes it more and more difficult to date. The modern form of dating is nothing like what happened in Bible times. These days, in America and many other Western countries, people date to get to know one another so they can decide whether they will marry one day. But that's not what we discover in Scripture. In biblical culture, we don't find dating to marry, but rather marrying to date. It's the opposite. A lot of the marriages in biblical times were arranged. The parents often decided whom their children would marry. One reason was that marriage was supposed to be the foundation from which a couple built the relationship, not that which killed it. As you seek to rekindle the love in your marriage, do the things you used to do when you dated. Repeat those things you did when you were relationship-driven, not program-driven. Repeat special words, kind gestures, dressing up, and remembering the other person's favorite food. Repeat seeking out things to do that you will both enjoy, carving out time when there is none to be had, trying to look your best. Repeat listening when you've heard that story several times before, or laughing when the joke really isn't that funny. Repeat noticing what it is about your spouse that sets him or her apart from the rest, and then point it out. Repeat these things and more, and you'll rekindle your first love. Relationships are powerful. 
The marriage relationship is one of the most intimate, rewarding experiences in life if you treat it with the honor, attention, and love it deserves. Nourish each other as you did at first. Guard yourselves from the program of marriage. Make every attempt to remember, repent, and repeat to rekindle that which caused you to marry in the first place. Okay, on page 71, this is your homework. <laughs> so sometimes it's, it's a discussion between couples. But it says encourage couples to discuss the following when they have time. In what specific ways have you and your spouse changed since you first started dating? And what part of your courtship or dating life would you most like to rekindle? And name three things you and your spouse can do this week to begin rekindling your first love. That's a discussion that you can have with your spouse and in your own time. And Lisa's going to read these last verses here. Okay. Miracles at Cana. Yes, so Miracle at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. You know, in the video, Dr. Evans pointed out that someone had to do something and display faith before a miracle could happen. And many of us want to say, God, do a miracle, and then I'll respond. But God is saying to us, respond, then I will do the miracle. So in, if we all respond to the kingdom purpose for marriage, if we will begin to fulfill what God has told us to do, then you will discover, like at the wedding at Cana, he has saved the best wine for last. That's where we're at. We need to reboot. We need to reset. Whatever we need to do, we need to get back and rekindle that first love. And ain't nothing wrong with starting over. We just need to start over and get it right. That's all we've got. That's the end of it. We, uh, we hope y'all have enjoyed this as much as we have presenting it and preparing for it through the week. And we, like I said earlier, I so appreciate y'all, y'all's faithfulness to this class. As, as far as Bible studies go, this one has been the one that, you know, the best attendance, in other words. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you start out with about 40 and you wind up with 17, you know, at the end, but but I really appreciate y'all's faithfulness. Anybody got any comments or anything they want to say? So everything we've been talking about tonight reminds me of that movie Fireproof. Mm -hmm. If I don't know if a lot of you have seen it or not, but it's about a couple and they're in a toxic marriage. And, huh? <laughs> no, not us, the couple in the movie. <laughs> um, but they're, you know, one spouse is inconsiderate to the other, and that causes the other spouse to be inconsiderate back. And it goes around in this toxic circle. Well, finally, the husband decides to do something and, and does and is obedient to the Lord and treats his wife the way the Lord calls him to and not how he thinks she deserves. And he stops that toxic circle and turns it around. And he starts doing the sweet things for her again and pursuing her again. And then eventually she comes around. And so he completely stopped the bad circle and stopped it and restarted it 
the right way because he was obedient to the Lord and treated her the way that God called her to. And we took, uh, we did a Bible study here quite a few years ago that the Hungerfords led on marriage. Kevin doesn't even remember that Bible study. <laughs> so apparently it was for me. But they talked about that. <laughs> we talked about it at the beginning of this, and he was like, what Bible study? Anyway, it, that's what sunk in for me was you can be going in a circle the right way or the wrong way, yeah. and you should always treat your spouse how God tells you to, not how you think they deserve in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that has served us fairly well. Anybody else? Weddings are important. Um, Genesis leads out with a wedding. Right. Jesus' first miracle, a pu public miracle, was at a wedding. Yeah. And Revelations ends with a wedding. So Absolutely. weddings are of utmost covenant importance. Amen. Good point. Anybody else? Anybody else? think that's it uh, you know I'm just glad y'all want to see the pictures again the marriage <laughs> pictures again <laughs> okay <laughs> was, there um, any, was there anybody I, you did not know yeah okay how do you want to do that you want to stand up yeah uh, Bobby can you play it Who's if the you first one uh, the Howard's yeah, so if you would, when when you, when it's playing and it's you, stand up. It's okay if you're by yourself tonight. He's working. Mm -hmm. That way, so, so 